Okay, let me introduce Luca Baggi, data scientist in Futura, and that will show us how to write Python bindings with, uh, with Rust, the new kid. Uh, <laughs> 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 So, um, there's a bit of slides here, but I want to make one thing clear. Now is the time to do something completely useless, okay? I think that this will not ever uh, touch any of you, like the 99% of you, which means maybe mostly your, your finger, will eventually one day have to do something like this. Uh, so, okay, lower your expectation. Also, if you came here for this, I'm sorry. Uh, second of all, this is really Rust intensive. You have to like, have a really high level of Rust. To do so, if you're not uh, really well versed into Rust, you can leave the room now. Joking, of course, it's super easy, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it, okay? I'm a data scientist, I, I'm, I'm no computer engineer, okay? Uh, no way, there's no way I would do it. But this really proves the point, it's really easy to do so. And we also get in the situation why we're really doing this, why we have to do this, and why I wanted to do this. Uh, we were covering the goals and we're trying to understand what is going on in the Rust ecosystem and trying to see what it needed to build um, a Rust and Python package, which is basically an excuse for me to uh, overwhelm you with the knowledge I've been trying to catch up with in the packaging ecosystem in Python. Um, then how we install the near required libraries, and then we'll be inspecting the structure of a Python package and the Rust and Python package, and we'll see some code, I swear. I will show you some. <clears throat> this is... Uh, uh, a talk that would be useful for Pythonistas as well as for Rustations. For Pythonistas in particular, um, you will get a good grasp of how to build and why and how the theory behind building Rust plus Python libraries and how to understand how a crate, which is a Rust package, is organized. And you will get your way around it, which is a remarkably like a nice skill to have nowadays. We will see why. Uh, we will be a bit of a familiar with a bit of the Rust syntax, and we will be so envious, I swear. I mean, they live in the year 3000. The tooling in Rust is stellar. I, would, I was drooling, okay? It was beautiful. I hope you will too. Uh, Rustations, on the other hand, will basically learn the same things, but it just pray for them to contribute to the Python ecosystem in some way, as well as we can do in their, not really in their ecosystem, but maybe we can just improve on the existing Python ecosystem one, and maybe do not flex too much for the great things that they have to um, show off. Uh, the rewriting in Rust has been a meme, at least since, I don't know, whatever, 2017, when I picked up uh, my laptop and started and installed like a terminal emulator, was 2020. Thank you, COVID, for that. Uh, I still, I, I think like I started like modern Unix repository on GitHub and installed uh, Exa because I was a cool guy who didn't want to use LS. Uh, and all the stuff, BAT is written in Rust. BAT is a cat clone with wings. Everything is written in Rust. Who uses uh, FZF is written in Rust. RipGrep is written in Rust. FZF is not Rust at all. It's Go, it's Go, it's Go, it's Go. okay. Rust in Rust. Skill, okay, good, you know, that's it. Excuse okay, that's it, goal, okay. Um, but also Python libraries are, are on, you might be using some of them which are already have a, um, a Rust core. Uh, or JSON is like the least suspectable one, but it was actually built in 2018. So there are Rust packages built uh, uh, inside Python since 2018 at least, which is, I would say, remarkable given that the recent hype about Rust has been developing the last year, two years or so, uh, mainly because libraries such as Pydantic, which is a, a, a typing, a runtime validation library for Python code that is used by FastAPI, is being, rewrite, is being rewritten. It's getting a Rust rewrite in the version 2.0, which is being, should be completed around end of the month or so. Um, also, by the way, Samuel Colvin, lead developer at uh, Pydantic, just got like a, a stellar amount of uh, seed funding from Sequoia and other um, companies just to, to build an ecosystem around the Pydantic, a cloud ecosystem around it. So they're really cool. Check, do check them out. Uh, maybe when they build like the Rust core because it will be much faster, sensibly faster. Raf, you also, you, you should know it by now. It's one another like linters meant to replace the Flakate and all the, it's plugin ecosystem. It's blazingly fast and it just uh, surpassed the 10,000 stars threshold recently. And as, of course, if you've been last time to our, to the last um, Python 
I mean, I'm not talk I gave, you talked about polars, everybody's talking about polars nowadays, actually. It's not a cool kid anymore, it's just so mainstream, okay? But it's written in Rust. It's like a write of Python, of pandas with a, a Rust core, Data Frame Query Engine core. Uh, why Rust? I won't just uh, dig into this, but please understand that this is the situation we're in, okay? Everybody is just saying, okay, oh, you should write in Rust. And I'm here to tell you, uh, not really. I mean, if it is bro if it ain't broke, don't fix it, okay? So um, this is more like of a show you how it is done. And maybe if you want to contribute to some existing libraries, such as Roth, you will have to uh, know your way around it, even just to write the documentation, for example. Uh, maybe one day you will have to, and this maybe will be useful to you, but uh, just don't press it, okay, unless you're really actively uh, a Rust developer and then you might find useful to bring your tooling to Python. Um, I think we're better off spending more time studying the standard library and doing a sync IO stuff rather than pushing down stuff. Although, even though there are extremely good reasons for going down the Rust way uh, for most of you. Also, keep in mind that uh, there will be um, a PyCon talk about Robin, which is a Flask rewritten in Rust. So you might want to check that out. Duh, okay. <laughs> Let's just get to the, easy, the really interesting part from, from my perspective as a, a Python developer to, uh, aiming to bring and contribute to open source libraries. Um, packaging is done in two steps and not all oxidized Python libraries, so Python libraries with the Rust core are created equal. Uh, RAW, for example, um, is just a, a, the, the, Rust, the Python part of Rust is just a, a, a function, really one function that just calls the Rust CLI, so, okay. But on the other hand, Polars actually has Python function calling Rust code. So um, this leads us to separating the things into and identifying two different layers to this. Uh, the packaging, so creating a distributable artifact, what we call most, nowadays mostly wheels, okay. But also the calling Rust code from Python and vice versa. So um, the same thing as some, like, some people that work on these you know the, the foreign function interface, the C foreign function interface, and basically bindings are a way to call one language from another. Uh, most of the time you should be calling Python, a Rust code from Python, but sometimes you might want to do the opposite. For example, there is this Rust NumPy library that provides uh, Rust bindings to NumPy. Uh, why would you want to ever do this? Uh, a, because there is no, like maybe there is like not such an advanced at the moment uh, uh, Rust library to uh, work with uh, a numerical arrays and do numerical computation yet, just wait for a couple of whatever. Um, but also because you might want to tap into Python processes. And this is the same thing that TGRS, so PyTorch for Rust, aim to do. So there is already a very well developed, very, very, very like broadly used, efficient library, which is PyTorch, okay, sorry, TensorFlow. <clears throat> Why rewriting it in Rust when it's already there? Um, to do these two layers, uh, Pythonistas and Rustation as well can use these tools. The first one is Maturin, which is, uh, I don't know, um, I it's not like PIP for Rust, but it's the interface, the CLI that you use to um, build these distributable artifacts as Python packages. There are alternatives, but this is like the highest level one with the highest level of abstraction with the least required amount of reconfigurations. And also then there is Pyo3, which is the library that and um, actually the crate that is used in Rust to um, create the binding. So basically uh, calling like importing a Python function, a function in Python, which actually under the hood calls Rust. And it, the main reason to show this off is just even just to get, to get a glance about how this works, there will be some nice things um, involved in this, like can be meta programming. And you will just get a feeling for how complex this can be and how elegantly this is handled. So even if you're not ever gonna use this, uh, spoiler, that's likely for most of us, it's really interesting just to know it for the sake of it because it, it really gives left me a lot for me personally, but I hope so for you. So how do we install it? Uh, we need it to, use, to be using at least Python 3.6. Um, maybe not just for this reason, okay? There are many good reasons to be using like a much more recent version. Uh, also like a 1.4 version of Rust. I think Rust right now is like 1.6, so that's like a quite recent one. Um, you can use a new, maybe you should use the uh, version manager for these kind of projects. Uh, there is Rust app, okay? Which is the official version manager 
in, uh, of Rust. That's wonderful. We get to use PyEnv, which is not official in Python, but is really popular. It's a really good space of support. If you use multiple tools, you can use ASDF. But if you want to use like a Rust version of ASDF, you can use uh, RTX. Spoiler, I'm using it. I found it like this week. It's really nice, OK? It also has some technical choices, different choices, which are interesting. But we can discuss it over, over a beer later. Um, and then we need to install Maturin, which is the uh, poetry of Rust plus Python. And for that, also, sorry, another recommendation. I will stop being paternalistic in a second. Uh, you should be using pipx, pip install dash u. Um, technically, if you can avoid it, pipx is here for you. Creates in, in virtual environments that will just have inside of them uh, your Python CLIs, so they don't mess up with your system Python of your local installation, and will lead to like, maybe uh, packaging resolution, dependency resolution, in a much nicer way. And then you will use this beautiful command, matter renew, and then you will say, tell you the name of the project that you want to use. In this case, I use the same name of uh, uh, the talk tonight talk. And matter will prompt you to choose a library that will use your bindings. And we will select Pyo3. And just to give you a broad overview, and then we will move on like to the practical coding example. This is the thing that it would be created. And I just wish Python had something like this. You get uh, an automatic CI CD pipeline, a GitHub action for automatically deploying, building, and, the, and publishing your package to PyPy whenever you push a new tag on your master branches. Uh, this is where uh, the source code lives, the Rust source code lives. And these two files basically um, are the configuration file for Rust. And also, you will get the pyproject.toml because, um, of course, given that you use two languages, you need to configure both the Rust part and the, and the Python part. Um, the cargo toml is basically the Rust equivalent of pro by project .toml. It's like the rise of Toml packages has been, uh, as format to configure packages been like, uh, or whatever. I, I, when I started coding, it was already there, thanks to languages like uh, Rust, of course, but also Julia uses it quite a lot, and allows you to use this um, really expressive syntax, which really should be looking familiar to you because we have an, we should, you should all be using this by now actually because the setup.py is considered legacy. So uh, hurry up and migrate to pyproject.toml because it can hold all the information you need to build um, your, Python pro your Python modules and packages. Rust does the same thing. And what we're interested in here, aside from the name, the version, you see that is this lib section where, which defines how the package is used. Can you see that? Should I zoom maybe a bit? Hey, Magari, die. okay, is this? Uh, uh, okay, it's not getting any bigger. And good old, like, command path doesn't work. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Can we just make this bigger? I don't think so, right? Zoom. Hey, die. And then, hey, no, maybe this was too much. Okay, I had to, whatever. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't go much more than this. Um, but I will show you that here, for example, you have, you define the name of the library and, the, and on the bottom line, the added line, you need to tell it that's um, a crate that uh, uh, is meant to be exported and used as, a, like, as an external library, so as a, a, a dynamic library, okay, so like a DLL and all the kind of crazy stuff. And also, as dependency, it has Pyo3. Then you have the cargo.lock that if you use poetry or PDM, hopefully uh, it's like their respective lock file. It is a, like the requirement.txt format on steroids because it contains hashes and allows reproducible builds. And then you go on the Python side, which should look a bit more familiar to you. It just specifies a build system, which is uh, according to PEP like 517, and also the, the list of tools that you want to use. And it is important to see here that you need to use uh, um, Pyo3 as an extension model. This basically is how, like, all the amount of configuration that you need to do. Right now, you can just start writing Rust code and a couple of steps, and we can build a Python package using Rust bindings. Um, and this is really all it takes. And it is compliant with the latest standards, both in Python and Rust. And I think I can show you this in the code directly. So uh, yes, transition happened. We move here. We go here. We do. We go really hard on the zoom, right? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, because I have to zoom out here. Okay, okay, good, good. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Maybe, maybe even more. Okay. So what we do here is matterin. Uh, we create a new folder. Possibly we don't have to because we can just uh, uh, matterin new. 
give it from the name, it will tell you to ask you the binding to use. And it's done. And if we list, of course, using EXA, uh, we didn't CD into it, so we CD into PyMePyO3. And there you see, that's the kind of stuff that we were showing you before. Uh, what we do here is create a virtual environment. So we go like Python dash M dash M uh, Vamb, the module then to create a virtual environment. OK, then also we activate it with a couple more arguments. We are inside the environment. And what we can we do now? Uh, well, we can just look at the Rust code, okay? I'm not going to do like a live code on Rust. What did you expect? I was building like NumPy and Rust tonight. Um, but we can open NeoVim because we are uh, pro user, 10x developers, and go see the code inside. Uh, because, of course, if you code in Rust, we have to use NeoVim, okay? Come on, what we're going to do, like VS Code, okay? We, we, we do need for the speed and then use like a, an editor that is built on Electron, come on, okay? Um, there we go. This is the beautiful Rust, and there is a lot to say about this. Um, you, if you fall in love at first sight, I think we can forgive you. Um, the first line here is um, basically import star. Uh, this prelude is a convention to tell you basically like the standard library. So of course in Python you also already, you already have object in your default environment, the globals. Um, Rust globals are called like the standard library equivalent of Rust is called prelude. So by convention, everybody in the Rust ecosystem defines a prelude module inside their package in their crates, which from which you can import star all the things uh, that will be used basically. And then you see what's here first, uh, this weird thing. Think of it as a decorator. It's called a macro. Two macros, actually. One is called pi function that will basically, uh, at one time, will be expanded. Because since this is a macro, it's called it, we're entering the realm of metaprogramming, so code that generates code. And this will expand and will mutate this function, that just call it in this way, um, so that uh, it can be used both in Rust and Python. And you see that actually the Rust function at this very bare minimum example really feels like what we've been doing in Python for quite a long time, hopefully. So using type ints. So you see that we define a really dumb function called the sum as string. So it takes two numbers and adds them and returns them as a string, really high value. Um, we define, it takes in only two arguments because we cannot code more than this uh, in Rust at least. And then it returns just a string. But you see that since we're using inside the pi function, uh, we need to return a pi result object that belongs, that, that is imported from this namespace, which on its own returns a string. Uh, Rust uh, doesn't like, uh, like that it's not like Python, so you, there is no indentation. So you need to use uh, uh, curly braces, the squarely braces. And it returns, you see, OK, A plus B are the two arguments, it mutates it to a string, and that is done. This is our function. When we want to add new function to a module, um, we need to define a function in Rust. We will use the PyModule macro. This will generate, uh, can I go down? No. Oh, yes, a bit. OK. This macro, PyModule, will uh, tell Rust at runtime that this will be uh, available as a namespace to import uh, objects from in the Python way we know it. And you see that it has some weird arguments. It return, it takes in a Python object, a module object. This is a reference. Um, fancy rough stuff that inevitably like, is efficiency, more uh, type safety, memory safety, etc. Which returns a Python result with this uh, um, empty tuple, which is basically the empty object, in, which returns its none in Rust, for more or so. And you see that is, uh, um, we add the function to the module, and we just call another macro that basically wraps this. So basically, it has like inside this object, say, OK, take this, wrap this Python function, and make it available inside your module. These question marks are because the function might raise an error. And so Rust has a way for you to, like, even at compile time, but also like inside your, with your tooling, as you see here, um, we have an LSP. Uh, which is Rust Analyzer, which is bundled into Rust. So this is the official SP from Rust TM. Uh, nice to have. It will tell you to, that you need to handle those functions in case uh, there is, uh, um, they do not return the expected value. So this is all like lovely Rust sugar syntax or overcomplication. And you see that because it always returns the OK and uh, the empty tuple. So this, like, this empty object is this empty object. And this uh, technically is all you need to 
to, to have to write a, a, a Python model in Rust. Of course, you need to know Rust to do something really useful with that. Um, you can also add new function. Of course, you always have to uh, prepend your, uh, your Py function. Oh, non è vero? Py function. Wow, never use this at level of zoom. And then you can also define your new uh, print, no, maybe not print function, but wow, okay, this is copied though. And not really useful most of the time, but for me, especially in this kind of situation. Um, especially when it just basically tells you to do the same thing, but we can uh, subtract as a string, of course, um, and say that this is, takes an A, which is a U size, so an inside integer, B is another U size. Of course, uh, this can err in so many ways because uh, you've, we are subtracting two numbers, uh, so it can go into the negative range, and it will return another pi result, etc., etc. So, um, tada, non è vero? Oh, wow, come on. Th th this is why you shouldn't be using Copilot, by the way. Okay, um, I'm writing a lot of boilerplate, so it's been useful recently, but most of the time it isn't, especially with Rust. Uh, actually, you will get downvoted a lot on Reddit if you post with Copilot and Rust, so uh, because they really take it seriously, because memory safety, you cannot just write code in like that way. Um, and then, of course, when, when this function is done, uh, pi, can we just write for once? Pi result, okay, true Vim experience here, guys, okay returns a string, um, we open our brackets and it will be like our logic inside the code. Then of course we can also do m, m add function and we will also wrap another and then finally, oh good to know, okay, okay. Then it should be a semicolon here because of course Rust being Rust, it expects a semicolon and there we go. This is an error by the way, this is on the corner so don't expect my Rust to be so good. So this is the logic inside it. I mean, this is not how that you should be, capable of writing Rust module tonight, okay? This is like, if you find yourself wandering around polars, okay, you know how to move around it. And looking at it, it isn't half as bad. Like the convergence between the tools is remarkable, okay? Uh, because they, also, they always use the TOML, because these functions, aside from the Rust logic, they're really easy to uh, implement with a macro decoration, etc. One last thing, um, these are the doc strings. When you prepend two slashes, it's a comment. When you prepend three, it becomes a doc string. And uh, it supports markdown syntax. It will be converted into uh, markdown, uh, HTML and compatible with uh, markdown syntax. This is a nice thing here. We quit everything. Also tonight, we learn how to quit them. Okay, good to know. And then we can, uh, you can also list, we didn't change anything, okay, because we don't mess it up further. Uh, we would only be able to do that. We, we can break so many things, okay? Uh, but we can do something. We can actually do something uh, that I am able to do now. We can build, create a main.py file, okay? And call our, okay, our maybe um, a new Python function. From here, we can just simply from uh, uh, pyme pyo3, um, we can import uh, some string and and we could tell Copilot to write us a function that uses arg parse to um, <laughs> Copilot, sorry, ChatGPT to write the function with arg parse to some two modules. But we are lazy, so we'll just do um, a main function. So we will say main. Okay, there we go. We expand this name a bit. And we define a main function, and we will just simply we will return a string because, of course. Uh, we like it in this way. The function will take in no arguments because we are lazy. And uh, we just say, okay, let's just uh, print uh, uh, sum as string of one and two. Good, thank you, Copilot. Uh, 10 euros a month, very well spent. Uh, also, plus the violation of all your source code that you put on GitHub. So what is consent after all, if you even, put, even if you put a license in there. And then we just call the main. Actually, if you want to be really, really like show off, we've been doing our homeworks and studying the, the source library, we can say import sys and do, thank you, and then go to the back and say something, uh, sys.exit main, thank you for that, we just quit, and then uh, we, what we do, we can just say python uh, dot m, and of course we can run main, right? No, of course not. Uh, we need to do one thing before that, this is run maturin develop. And it will compile the module and it will install it as an editable package. So now, if we rerun 
it will print our design number outcome. So here, guys, we wrote our first package of Python Rust. <laughs> Good. Now you can just uh, know, push it to GitHub, flex a bit, and then RMRF the folder because this will happen to it. Uh, but there is more to it, okay? Um, and as you see here, we um, we go over the, the things that we've been already through. This is a procedural macro. It's called the procedural macro. Um, the other one below here is technically a declarative macro because it has the question mark. Print line, for example, which is the print equivalent of Rust, uh, is a macro as well because it, take, it takes in a number of arguments, blah, 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 blah. Um, but we can also create classes, okay? And the really powerful thing about these macros is that they, under the hood, they, um, export, actually just decorate them, use a Python jargon, and they will, and it will automatically under generate everything it needs to create a class object in Python. This is remarkable. And you can, the syntax for adding uh, a class to a Py module is slightly different, I would say a bit more concise than the wrapping function, but this and there is really a lot more than that because you can also define static methods, class methods. The documentation is really thorough and really very well written. Also, a lot of detail about the Rust part on this side. Um, you can also split your module, like have multiple Rust modules and organize your code in different. It doesn't have to be like a 10,000 lines long project, okay? Because you can say, import a, a module as you would do in Python. So use, you define another module called the US utils, for example, US utils, for example, and you say, okay, import everything from there, and then simply adding your Python function from there. You see that uh, inside of these, uh, the other US util.rust, we defined um, a function that determines the current OS. It is a public method of the crate, and then it is imported up above here and you see in determine core to S, it is mapped uh, inside uh, the class. We can also um, use a different syntax. Uh, we can define a public function called register inside the search utils. We do not use the utils above, and then we just simply import the module from there because uh, given that it is at the same level um, in, in the namespace, okay, we don't have to import it, we just simply call it like this. So it is also really, familiar for us to recognize which modules are used where and how to access them. So it's, my point is, um, it, it's not as complicated as it should be, okay? It's not like, maybe Rust is, can be tough to learn. Um, technically not, I mean, not as much as CS++, yes, I would say, I would argue, but I'm, I'm a data scientist, so I don't know these things, really. Um, but it's not so difficult to get, and it's, it feels familiar to Pythonistas, and it is really easy to intertwine the two languages. And um, why would you ever want to do that? Uh, maybe because writing uh, a C extension could be harder. Maybe, okay. Uh, I, I don't see like a thrust re rewrite in C. Uh, you can be the first one, of course, good luck, uh, handling all the memory and with the same part. Um, references all over the place, of course. Uh, Maturin has a wonderful documentation. PyOff is a nice documentation. You can, there is also, um, a YouTube video, I think it's called from 2019 from some folk over at PyCharm that was already at the time doing a, a reference, uh, like um, building Python plugins with Rust. So there's also like a useful resource. There are plenty of resources, that's, that's a nice thing. And so now I think you can uh, flex whatever and go to your friend and say, oh yes, I look inside the rough the code and it is really nice, I know how to work around that. But really it has some, uh, wonderful tools and like the, its syntax allows, I think will give you a lot of inspiration for how we can write better Python code, nonetheless, nevertheless. So it's good to have this um, low entry barrier in being able to get into a different library, a different language and draw inspiration from it. Uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, it was a nice ride. Thank you, Luca. Awesome presentation. Okay, if, if there is any, any question for Luca, please uh, <laughs> speak up. <laughs> you need to, to speak about Rust, please ask Alessandro, okay? Yeah. Please tell me, okay. I, I saw an end. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't code in Rust, so it's going to be a very okay, basic. Okay, uh, okay. <laughs> but um, no, I'm actually quite curious because, I mean, obviously, uh, 
coming from Python and typically, you know, the, the issue when you do things which should be pretty fast is in the, when you have recursing fu recurring fu function and typically, for instance, we use, I don't know, Numba, Numba IoT, yeah. something like that. Um, but where do you see the use case going forward of Rust within Python? Is kind of Numba IoT competitor or there is something much more than right now I don't see? I mean, I'm not, I don't code in Rust, so I don't know, but I'm happy to have your view of how things are moving towards this, uh, this space. Thank you. So, uh, really nice question. Uh, my feelings about that are uh, th there is a, a machine learning ecosystem in Rust. It's called Lympha. Uh, I don't think it will ever be as prominent as uh, Scikit-Learn. Scikit-Learn is uh, wonderful. There's an, an extensive amount of documentation, so I don't think it will be rewritten in Rust. Okay, maybe some pieces of it, though it will be like a real hell uh, working with that. So I think that. Things that are there are here to stay. I don't see that why, uh, for example, PyTorch would want to rewrite itself in Rust. They already moved from Lua to C, and now they're trying to uh, just in time compile uh, code generated by PyTorch to uh, basically target directly uh, machine code. So um, depends on the sector. From my perspective as a data scientist, a machine learning engineer, whatever, in the data ecosystem, data science, machine learning, especially, I don't think nothing relevant will happen. You see posts about the data engineering functional most of the time because it is memory safe, uh, be, mostly also because of the, the amazing tooling. I have snapshot tests. Uh, they have uh, um, a recommended uh, official Rust linter uh, formatter. So maybe writing more system programming code that is closer to processes might be simpler in Rust. Um, the way you see it in Python, we will get a lot of uh, uh, tools, coding tools, static analysis tools, for example, that will be written in Rust, for my feeling. So I, rough, easier to stay, for example, this is one. Um, and we, I think we will see more of those in the near future. Uh, you, you can also see a case for more performant libraries. Um, the, the Polar's case is a bit, particular, peculiar, um, but Rust, given memory safety in Rust, you might want to, it, it, it might be easier also from a developer experience to write uh, multi-threaded code in Rust because by definition, given how it works in terms of memory safety, uh, it is simpler to use it. But also one of the reasons Polars is so popular is because Pandas um, doesn't really have a query plan, a query, a query engine, um, and NumPy is a wonderful backend for um, what is called um, numerical computing, but not data frame operations. Um, it really depends. I see as a trend, maybe not in numerical computing, but in lower stuff that works with memory, reading stuff, exchanging stuff, uh, it's definitely really will be really used. <clears throat> also because of the Arrow project. Uh, how about you know Arrow, the memory query engine? Ah, still a little, okay. It was originally another idea for the topic of tonight, explaining how, what is Arrow, Apache Arrow, what they're doing. Um, Arrow is wonderful in-memory format for representing uh, data with a wonderful, like an amazing degree of compression and extremely performant computational capabilities. Um, Arrow basically is an interoperable format. You can access to object inside the computer memory written in the Arrow format from uh, uh, C, C++, Java, uh, Rust, Julia, uh, Python through C, of course. Um, people building application on Arrow are mostly using the Rust interface. So there are the, uh, I would say the successors of Apache Spark is called Ballista. Hopefully we'll see it in like in five years or so. Uh, it's written in Rust and offers Python bindings. So maybe new tools, tools already there will still be used and we'll still be maintaining C in Cython in uh, blah, blah, in Numba. But maybe new tools that need this kind of view, maybe from a developer experience, from a their developer, but probably writing code, maybe it's nicer to Rust the C code, uh, Rust code rather than C code, also for the memory handling. Sorry it took so long. But if some of you have Rust experience and want to tell their own, I mean, this is just a, a speculation. So um, 
please prove me wrong, okay? Though I would love to be right. Un applauso alla birra. Questo. Uh, I thought you wanted a beer. <clears throat> uh, no, sorry. Yes, also for the beer. So this one for the beer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> for the question. Um, what about the other way around? Embedding Python in a Rust application? Oh, yes, definitely. You really want that. Uh, um... Um, okay, I, I, wouldn't sh I didn't want to show you because I wanted to keep it short, but uh, you can. It It is done in these libraries. Um, maybe, uh, so for example, the NumPy, uh, the Rust NumPy crate. Uh, the PyTorch Rust crate, uh, but also you want to do it in your Rust Python applications when, for example, you want uh, um, an object to stay in the Python heap, so in the in, in the Python memory side, and and you want to keep it with external Python logic and Rust logic. But you can do that. Uh, it should be almost as straightforward, actually. And if you see down here, oh, this I think makes so much noise in the registry. Sorry, people at home, like the three people at home. Um, I think it's here, for example, here. PyO3 has a Python object. This is the same one that we were defining our Py functions. And with Agile, of course, you can use your Python system and use Python inside. You see here, basically, this is doing a. Um, an anonymous function, okay, it's calling like defining on the lambda on the fly, and it's calling this object pi. And from the Python object, we import sys, and then we get adder. So, with a sprinkle of uh, Rust syntactic sugar, we can still call a bit of uh, a Python code from there. We can use the use uh, Python modules. Uh, so maybe the next scikit learn won't be written in. Uh, in Rust, or will be written in Rust, but still maybe under the code, under the rule, uh, under the hood, will be called joblib. Or maybe we can just rewrite a bit of joblib and then uh, use some variant. We can use it for writing different backends. That's another really interesting thing. Uh, and we can make sure, for example, that Pandas has its own NumPy backend. We can have his uh, uh, extension array backend back, back by NumPy uh, arrow. So this can also be a way of it to say, OK, I need, still need to interact with Python code, um, which should be easier for um, Rust users in this way, I would say, more than for us. There is another question. Oh. Somebody in the front? Uh. So inside our Python code, it's possible to have IntelliSense uh, to the Rust part, to using the Rust functions? Um. Thank you. So um, see, like, oops, where is my terminal? OK, good. Um, so you, you, you asked if we can have, uh, like, IntelliSense or like coding tools, static tools, inside the Python code that calls Rust, right, Where, for the Rust part. Yes. Um, since I'm uh, the edgy cyber guy that needs to uh, Payne portrays himself as a developer. Uh, I was using Vim. So inside Vim, you, you need to install an LSP provider. It's called uh, an, an Vim LSP config, which is wonderful, works great. Uh, but the LSP uh, Python, that it, for Python, is called PyWrite, uh, needs a bit of tweaking and configuration to work uh, out of the box. But I'm pretty confident that if you did uh, what I like this example and in uh, uh, inside VS Code, it will recognize it. Actually, here, um, the errors we're getting are from MyPy because it wants uh, static types, because we do not have types available inside this module. So technically, since we're not seeing this module as foreign, our uh, standard tools are, really, are actually already working for that out of the box. Uh, we, I mean, inside here, we, we do not call Rust code, so there is no Rust completion inside here available. Did I answer your question? Kind of. Yeah. So what kind of uh, uh, IntelliSense would you, were you thinking of? Uh, yeah, like uh, like, uh, 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 ah, OK, OK. So for my very limited experience, um, and from what I've read around, uh, it should work as regular because the um, 
meta class like the macros work this out so there's they're available as python objects so you get all the features for that actually let me see if i oops it's hard that we've just one hand okay uh for example i do not get completion for the module summer string but if we go back to rust the py3 user guide and we look at python functions you see that uh, for example you can override the name and down here you can define a doc the documentation i found i i knew i knew there was one uh, you can also power variadic arguments at my function calling python function no 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 i i'm sure i read somewhere that you can make the rust uh, um doc string available as a python uh, doc string so you can also get that kind of completion and you should also get uh, the completion for the arguments uh, not here maybe so for example just uh, so it's kind of strange because i need to just code in one hand but uh, um aside from ah, oh yes that, that's a really clever thing that's that's the senior developer difference guys okay okay <laughs> that's that's what doing kubernetes means okay uh well voila okay if we just say sum uh, as a string uh, can i just um lsp stop uh, copilot for once lsp info no okay no no okay i can't i can't throw you around okay okay uh if you start a string we can we just get a copilot completion for now so i think i should work on this a bit more um a b no okay one two no, okay. Uh, we don't get it right now, but I think that this is mostly due to the fact that I did not configure uh, Pirate properly. Eh, could be better. Okay. Okay. Okay, we reached the, the 40 minutes, so. Can I, can I give you a feedback? Yes. Yes, next time, next time use the dark mode for the slide because I get tanned. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, sorry. Ciao. Uh, you? She died, you did I. Uh, so, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. And uh, we will meet outside or maybe in the, in the, in the lobby above to, to organize a beer, I don't know, something. Uh, if you want to join, uh, just just wait. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.